Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Teledyne ISCO's May POMP webinar. Today's webinar is Introducing the Periscopic Pumping Technology Coming to Teledyne ISCO called the Periaxis. Today's webinar is being led by Nick Dadabo, our POMP's product line manager. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please utilize the chat function within the Zoom platform. All questions will be answered at the end. Uh, this webinar will also be available uh, to all registrants and attendees after the webinar on our YouTube page later on this week. So at this time, I will turn it over to Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking some time with us and learning a little bit about our peristaltic pumping technology. Uh, first off, let me talk to you, just a little introduction. As we said before, I am the pumps product line manager. Uh, been in the product line management business for pumps for over 18 years, almost 19 now, uh, different organizations, as you can see there. Um, and key focus markets, oil and gas, pharma, pharmaceuticals, production, uh, chemical, food and beverage, uh, even plastics added in there. So a kind of a broad pumping experience. So enough about me, let's talk about the topic at hand. First, um, let's get a little bit of understanding of what peristaltic pumping is, or what a peristaltic technology is. Uh, very quickly, sorry that's a very busy slide, but it's a good definition and understanding of how peristaltic pumps work. You know, they are considered a positive displacement pump versus a rotary pump like your centrifugal pumps, your uh, multi-stage pressure pumps, et cetera. That's, that's not these, these are positive displacement. Used for pumping a variety of fluids and materials. It's, and it stays within the flexible hose uh, inside the pump. So that's a key thing to remember, uh, is the material you're pumping and what you're moving is actually contained within the hose. And you know the name peristaltic comes basically from what our human body does, a process called peristalsis. And your intestines, your body moves and squeezes and moves material inward and outward. Uh, alternating compression and relaxation of the hose or tube or et cetera, and it's just pulling it, pulling product in, pushing product out, almost kind of like squeezing the toothpaste tube when you're rolling things, rolling the toothpaste out. So what is the? Let's talk about the process just to get a visual, and then the next slide will show some pictures and a bit of an animation. Uh, you know, a rotating shoe or a roller rolls and squeezes the length of the hose or tube and creates a temporary seal between the suction and discharge. And then as it lets go the pressure moves along the tube and it forces the product to move away from the pump and then also pulls it in the discharge line. So it's just like a little little ball goes and squeezes the tube up and down. Uh, very simple, very, very, very basic technology. As you can see here, there's a bit of an animation moving there. Um, it's showing you the rollers or the what in some cases a shoe, some certain design, squeezing the fluid. You can see the blue fluid in, blue fluid out, uh, intake uh, and out. And then there's different the shapes of the pump heads are set up. The horizontal version, as you can see in the left, is rolling like that. The more vertical version is the three rollers with the hose at the peak, and it squeezes in and out there. Um, and keep in mind, when, we talk about per when we're talking about peristaltic pumps today, we are talking about lab scale, uh, lab sizing. There are uh, peristaltic pumps out there that are used in the oil and gas industry that are very, very large and uh, it could be up to 10, uh, six to seven, uh, six, to six feet high, et cetera. Those are some massive peristaltic pumps. Same exact type technology though. Obviously it takes more pressure, more strength, more energy to squeeze a thicker hose that's got all that mass material in it. But in this case, when we're talking for today, when we talk about peristaltic pumping, we are talking about lab scale in the type that you actually just kind of put on your, uh, into a, a counter or into a fume hood. So why would somebody look at peristaltic technology? Well, first and foremost is one of the things I talked about just earlier is the fluid only contacts the flexible tubing. So it's a contamination free pump system. that's really easy to clean and really easy to maintain. That's very important when you're using kind of hazardous type materials or uh, for just simplicity of changing and flipping applications. You can have the case where you can have a peristaltic pumping jelly 
uh, grape jelly out and one and when you're done with that experiment or that application take the hose out bring the pump over to the next section put a new clean hose in and it can start pumping tomato sauce and you don't have to worry about cleaning the pump or cleaning anything else because you're just getting rid of the hose where only the fluid is contained perfect perfect scenario very good is a generic transfer pump but there's many other applications you'll see here shortly they're self-priming and they're non-siphoning and they handle high viscosity that's the great thing here is the pump speed, the roller speed, and and uh, uh, the thickness of the hose can ha can uh, help you move viscous materials. Meaning, if it's a highly viscous material, kind of thick like molasses type material, or maybe even somewhere on a tar consistency, you're going to have the po the roller probably move in a slower manner with a thinner hose that helps it kind of put the pressure, use the pressure to squeeze the material out. Obviously, there's different ways to handle that. You can heat the fluid up before you go in there. You can use different types of hoses, et cetera. But on a very basic level, it's, it's, uh, it's, it can handle very good, uh, high viscosities very well. Uh, because of the low shear pumping action, which is really just a simple, just pushing fluid through, it's not, and it's not touching and damaging the material. You can handle live cells, large protein suspensions, anything that might be sensitive to shear, you wouldn't have any, you should have no issue here um, using peristaltic pumps. So let's look at some of the advantages and the disadvantages. We have talked about some of them already here. Uh, no wetted parts. The fluid stays in the hose and low contamination risk. The only time you where you have to worry about potential contamination <clears throat> is if the hose starts to wear and, it, and there happens to be a crack or something that develops in there. Um, as you'll see under the disadvantages there, ho hose, hose wear life does vary. It depends on the roller speed, how long you're running the pump, uh, what the material the hose is made of, what the material is flowing through there. And it just, just the, you know, because rubber, when you flex rubber or a rubber-like material like Norprene or anything else, you know, it's, it, it will wear over time, especially if it has one some, a roller keep rolling over the same spot over and over and over. It, that will start to wear. Uh, but that's a common common concern with peristaltic pumps. If that's an issue for you for your application or the design of your application, I would say probably peristaltic technology is not something you want to use. You want to look at a reciprocating pump or a syringe pump or something along those lines. Um, sanitary hose availability. There are many, 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 many different styles of hoses and types of hoses, uh, materials you can use. Um, some are FDA grade, some are pharma grade, some are you know, super hazardous material. There's the generic one that most people use that is that's very good all purposes, a norprene material, kind of more of a rubber or neoprene type material. Um, but there are, there are hoses out there available from many different vendors um, that are great for pharmaceutical and food applications. Um, easy maintenance, very, very quick change of hoses. Um, Quick change of application flexibility also. You know, some of the disadvantages, if your application or your experiment is, uh, can, is affected by pulsation, uh, you definitely don't want to use a peristaltic pump. There is, I mean, it has a steady pulse to it. I mean, it's not, you can't add a pulse dampener like you can in some reciprocating pumps. It's just not something you can do with this type of technology. It's more of a just keep squeezing through and keep squeezing it through. And then the performance envelope, you're not going to get super high pressures with this product. So if you need something in the 1,000 to 2,000 PSI range, you typically won't see that with peristaltic pumps. I know the ones we're talking about here, 40 to 100 PSI sometimes, but mostly 40 PSI. Uh, it's The design of a peristaltic pump is, is actually targeted towards general purpose fluid or material moving or, or dispensing and um, also uh, moving viscous fluids. You know, very, very good for vis viscous fluids. If you look at the diagram there, it shows you a better <clears throat> kind of a drawing that uh, ties back to the previous slide that shows the rollers and everything else, but you can see how that technology would work with that drawing there. Let's touch on some of the markets and applications for peristaltic pumping technology. Um, some of the key markets out there, and, and obviously, you know, everybody has their priority and key markets they deal with. These are two we've identified based on our, uh, uh, I've identified based on our strategy of my organization. But, you know, pharmaceuticals, with, these are fabulous product pumps to use in flow chemistry applications when you're adding reagents into a process. 
You'll find more to most part, you'll see these in just labs and fume hoods, but they will be sometimes used in scale and pilot plants. You know, the whole principle of single use comes into play here perfectly. <clears throat> if you, like you said, you can actually take the hose you're using with a material and throw it away. You don't even have to wash down the pump because you don't have to worry about it. It didn't touch the pump. So the concept of single use development or single use product development, which is starting to really kind of move itself through into the pharmaceutical world, um, not exactly like the throwaway packages that you're seeing in some pumps, but this is definitely something that would qualify in that area. In pharmaceuticals, you're moving viscous fluids all the time. There's all kinds of different types of research going on, creating new medicine and drugs, and viscous fluids do come into play a lot. Um, so this is a nice add-on. So if you have some <clears throat> reagents that are thicker that you can't necessarily run through a reciprocating pump because of the check valve issue that might stick the check valves, or if the syringe pump you're using is just too much volume for you, this is definitely something an option for you to consider. Uh, same in oil and gas and chemical, you know, the reactant feed or full chemistry applications, uh, when you're looking at biomass or energy research, you know, you've got very thick kind of tarry type substances you're using. Um, that's definitely a perfect spot for this. And it gives you the capability that if it's an aggressive type material that you really don't want to put your hands on, you can just throw it away. Take the hose out and throw it away. Um, makes it nice and easy. Um, so these are definitely key couple key spots. There are some additional markets. Um, wastewater treatment. Uh, if you're into water treatment, you know, dosing, dosing sodium hypochlorite to uh, dispense for treating water, treating wastewater to begin the cleansing process. Peristaltic pumps play in there very well, very, very well. The food and beverage market, um, you know, adding flavor, being a, an additive pump for flavor, or like we we're just talking about dispensing tomato sauce or pizza sauce onto a frozen pizza in a, in a factory or something like that, or ice cream. I mean, things like that. I'm kind of hungry now, but, um, you know, kind of the dispensing uh, aspect of food and beverage uh, definitely comes into play here. Very steady, very thick. You know, you get into your thicker, like I said, molasses, you got sauces, jellies, stuff like that. If you need to add those in your process, that works out perfect for you. This is a great pump for you. Plastics, looking at adding color into the extrusion process as the product gets extruded, uh, that's a perfect opportunity. <clears throat> Dispensing UV coating material in, into the material that's getting extruded as it goes, that's also a perfect opportunity. Um, you know, you'll deal with, you want to set up your flow rates, you want to set up how much you want to, to, to dose in there, and you just put the hose in the, in the container where the additive is and have it pump it right through. Very, very easy to use. Okay, so these are some high-level markets. As we look at some of the things here, you know, uh, there's, uh, I kind of drilled down into some very specific applications. I'm not going to touch on every one of them, but definitely, you know, biotechnology, which I also lump into pharmaceutical. There's a lot of applications there for that. Uh, academia, you know, academia goes across all of the markets we talked about because there's research programs that are uh, going on in all of the focus, uh, focus areas that we have here. But you can see, you know, sampling, you got general lab dispensing, uh, filling single-use bioreactors, you know, some buffer circulation. There's all kinds of that stuff, especially in these markets. These are more like life science areas. But as you get into, this is more of an industrial set. Again, these are all different uh, types of areas that I kind of just kind of put together some stuff. You know, like agriculture, ag work is always all kinds of research going on, but chemicals, food, water, wastewater, you know, additive metering, just metering in specific types of additives to any applications you're using. Um, you know, chemical feed for disinfection, there, there's your water, wastewater application, right? General dispensing. You know, all of these applications kind of roll up under general dispensing. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give it just a snippet or a flavor of different uh, different specific types of applications. Uh, I did some looking around also and just saw, found some diagrams here to actually bring out some uh, potential applications. You'll see in the upper left there the substrate one, substrate two, and you have two pumps that are designated in the diagram. And really what that does is it kind of roll, it pushes it into um, the reactor where the bio, bio catalyst is, you know, those are two peristaltic pumps that are there. Um, you can see another type of pump down below that goes from microfluidic reactor, um, but also you can use a peristaltic pump in that application. But these are just simple ones that I 
happened to find out on the internet that, uh, that describes and shows uh, a flow chemistry application. Uh, here's another one here. This is more the water wastewater side of things as far as treatment, chemical treatment and stuff, but you can see that's a, the, the box there shows kind of a peristaltic type looking pump, but all it's doing is pumping it up into a kind of a reactor there with glass beads in it and then running it into treated water. So, um, you know, very simple, this is a transfer pump. It, it moves material here and there, or it can be additive. So it's, if you need to add something to the, appli the, the application you're using. Let's look at some things to consider when you're deciding on uh, the peristal a peristaltic pump. Um, you know, first and foremost, you want to understand the material you're going to be pumping and the, if the hose that, that you're supplied will be able to be uh, applicable for that. I will tell you that the, because there are so many different hose manufacturers for peristaltic pumps, there's also so many different charts out there to tell you to talk to you about chemical uh, uh, comparison into the hose material that you might be using. So that's a simple Google search and pulling that up um, and looking and saying, okay, does this work with norepinephrine, et cetera? You can find that anywhere, not just uh, uh, on, on anybody's website. So that's first and foremost. Then you need to understand the flow rate you need because what really gets impacted, flow rate is impacted by the diameter of the hose and the rate of the roller, okay? And, and just to give you an idea, you know, you, the, when we talk about flow rates that are capable on a product that we offer, that is based off of a specific speed of roller and water, and water at a separate temperature. So, you know, the changing the viscosity up to more of a jelly type material will definitely affect your ability for uh, the, the, the flow rate that's stated. And a hose diameter, you know, the thicker the hose, the harder it is that the roller has to press and squeeze it out. So you have less of a squeeze on the jelly coming out of the tube where a thicker, a thinner hose is gonna be able to be more flexible and actually be able to move material maybe a little faster and you'll have the rollers going at a specific rate. So really try to understand the flow rate you need. Now usage rate, as we talked about hoses wearing out, you know, is this something that's gonna run for 24 hours? And if it runs for 24 hours at a certain rate, you know, try to calculate and sometimes the hose manufacturers can tell you the, specific, uh, the life of the hose, like how many squeezes or rolls you get out of it based on an average roller speed and roller, roller rate. So, you know, the, the, the hose is definitely a consumable app, a consumable piece of the product that you want to look at. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's going to run out in two weeks, right? But if you're running it for 24 hours a day for three months straight, you may want to keep an eye on the wear life of that hose just because that's a lot of squeezes in three months, right? Um, the size, you know, as space is a premium for everybody and, you know, in applications in labs and pilot plants and countertops and, and, and other types of machines, um, you know, you can stack the products that we offer. You can stack them on top of each other to still work. They're good small footprints. Most of your peristaltic pumps will be smaller in size. Um, you're not going to, again, you're not, unless you get into the bigger ones I talked about before. And in that case, you're not going to be dealing with this type of technology very much anyways. <clears throat> and then number of units. I mean, I look at how many number of units you want to use. If you've got to have four different things coming into through the reactor or two different types of reactors, do what, you know, how do you want to do it? You know, do you need, did you, are you worried about precision and pulsation? Well, I wouldn't say you want a peristaltic pump. You'd lean more towards a syringe pump. So maybe for reagent A, you use a syringe pump. If you have, you know, a viscous fluid going into reagent B and C, throw in a couple peristaltic pumps and then reagent D, if you just need to move something at, at kind of a pulseless rate, um, you get a reciprocating pump with a pulse dampener on it and you've got four, you've got three different pumps dosing in four uh, types of chemicals, creating the material you want to create at the speeds you want to speed. So you want to look at how many, need, how many uh, units you might potentially need. The other thing I'll caution you to is ensure the product meets your needs, not your price point, okay? And this is probably something I've, that you should, shouldn't talk about on a webinar, but I really want to help you. I want you to understand when you're looking at a peristaltic pump or looking for a peristaltic pump, okay? You know, there's a lot of different options out there for peristaltic pumping. And some are, you know, $100, some are $10,000. It all depends, but you want to look at does the pump do what you need it to do, Okay. Can you program it to the flow rate you need? Can it be set and let it run by itself? Can it dispense? Can it intake? Can it handle certain types of hoses that are available? You, you want to consider all of that. Don't just go for just any peristaltic pump because there's some out there that are just, you know, that's all there is is a roller and a hose and that's all it is. That's all it does. 
or there's other ones you can program through the computer. You can get a message when they're slowing down or when there's issues or and keep track of the squeeze, squeezes on your hose. You know, make sure the product meets your needs because this is a technology that is broadly designed and you want to make sure you're dealing with one, the, the strongest vendor for your case that's going to support the product, but also make sure the pump is going to support what you need it to do. Hose selection, we talked about the importance of hoses, and I want to just kind of put a little bit of sli slice into this here. You know, construction diameter hose it can determine a type of fluid in the flow rate. We said that earlier. It's all, we also said tubing life is affected by pump speed, the pressure you use, the tubing material, the material abrasiveness, and the chemical compatibility. If you have a viscous material with a lot of, a lot of grit and grind in it, you're going to wear the pump out from the inside over time. So you want to factor all of that into the types of tubing you get, the amount of tubing you buy, and, uh, and, and just calculate that out, or at least you know, ask the vendor to help you calculate that out. The ability to change hoses quickly is important to consider when choosing a pump. I cannot stress that uh, any more than, than that, because if there is, if there is a uh, difficult changing process for the hose, you're going to have to bring a tech in, take some time, a pump will be down, all that stuff. I can tell you the pump that we're offering to Periaxis, literally it's it's like a 30 second hose change. Uh, and there's there's a few other folks out there that are not that short, but they do don't take a lot of time to change hoses. So you want, if that's, that's the ability to change the application or change the hose quickly is important to you from a safety factor, from having the downtime issue, and from the factor of having to bring a tech in, you know, really, really look for that. Again, there's a broad offering of peristaltic pumps out there, and only very few of them offer quick change capability. Okay. As I said before, many different hose materials are out there. We offer kind of the norprene, which is the most common across the board. We'll have a corrosion resistant in a in a pharmaceutical food grade. Also, we're not going to be offering 20 different hose types. There's many people out there you can get uh, you can get that variation from, but we're going to be offering just a few more bases. So uh, a little enough about that. Let's talk about the periaxis. Okay. So anybody that's familiar with uh, Teledyne Isco and our pump offering, you'll know we have the reaxis line of products. That is actually reaxis for a reciprocating pump. Here we have the periaxis for peristaltic pump. You know, it's marketing guys. We kind of get crazy about that sometimes. So anyway, this will stick in your head. This is the periaxis, and this is the launch of the product. Um, very small footprint peristaltic pump. It has an icon-driven menu. Uh, pretty easy and intuitive to set up. We have a manual to be available to help you do that. It has an open head sensor. So when you open the pump head, which is the white and gray thing with a little brown uh, gray lever on it, you turn that lever, it lifts the white top up, you take the hose out. The drive knows to stop when that is open. You can have a filling or dispensing applications and it can go backwards or forwards. So, you're, so the pump can re run in reverse and it can run forward. Um, it tells you, you know, tubing retention is there, very easy, you set it in there, it holds it, grabs it, it saves time and, and for the installation, it's very easy to install. Um, I did it, I think, in 30 seconds, which is a, a pretty good task. And uh, additional application flexibility, you can change the application that you're using for the pump within minutes. Uh, and that's a great thing, because that helps you get more of an ROI from your investment, because you can use it for more than one application. Uh, flow range up to 480 mils a minute. Like I said, that was the 480 mils a minute is based off a size 16 hose, and it's all based off of water with your average roller rate and average speed and a pressure of about uh, 30 psi. Okay, so that's if you're looking for 480 mils, that's how you do that. I had said uh, that the pump can run dry without damage to the pump because uh, all it is is a roller squeezing a hose. So if the hose has nothing in it, the roller is still going to squeeze the hose. Uh, it can get up to 40 PSI. You, you can control it remotely um, via 25 pin connector on the back of the product. So if you're using a, uh, a controller or if you're using a uh, control system, you should be able to program this in. And the pump head can be used for continuous uh, lengths of tubing. You know, the, the length of tubing you use all depends on how long, where you're, where you're putting it, where you're spacing it out to. Okay. Some key, key product points. You know, it's a small footprint, very ergonomic, desi ergonomic, ergonomic design, very easy to set up, high into very intuitive controls, very easy to figure out and program. Uh, up to 480 mils, it's actually 40 psi. It's very easy 
to use external user interface. Um, very easy to load, less than 15 seconds for folks that are adept at it. I did it in 30 seconds, so that's pretty good. Uh, very high quality, and you know you can do pump and dispense with it. So it gives you more flexibility. The pump can do more than just one application. Those are just some key things to think about. So as we hit into home stretch here, let's talk about the ISCO family of pumps and what you know, what this what we have with this. So we've added the Perry Access pump to enhance our position in in the market as far as the markets we address: petro oil and gas, petrochemical, pharmaceuticals, etc. You know, we're more, we're becoming more of a pumping solution provider. We have broader options that handle all the different types of things you need from your application, from viscous fluids that cause hazardous fluids, to precise dosing, to high pressure, to low pulsation. We have many, many different options. Also, we know that we, we've heard from many customers that customers are trying to shrink down the number of vendors they deal with every day as far as getting their products. We are now moving towards a one-stop shopping for pumping needs for our customer base. Uh, you know, it just we have years of success in the in the in the pharmaceutical and oil and gas market, so we're just continuing to leverage that, and we're becoming a select manufacturer that offers three types of pumping at the technology to offer uh, to meet your application needs. Basically, you can come to us, and we've got three different ways to try to help your you or your customers uh, satisfy their pumping and application needs. And just a quick overview of what our pump family is. You know, we have the D-series pump. So when you need precision dosing and pulseless operation, you go right to our pumps. If you have a broad range of applications, you need continuous flow, you need a Hastoy, and you're not, and a little bit of pulsation is okay with you, you go right up into our Reaxis uh, reciprocating pump. And now when you need all-purpose pumping and to move high viscous, uh, highly viscous fluids, we now have the Periaxis peristaltic pump. That is a rounded out family of options and capabilities for all your application and your, your yours or your customer's application needs. With that, I do want to say we look forward to uh, satisfying any, any pump questions or needs you have. And at this time, we'll kind of open up the questions. Just a reminder, uh, you can use either the chat function or the Q&A function to submit your questions. All right, so Tori, we do have one that just came in. Um, and the question was, you know, is there a specific software that uh, the pump can be connected into? Well, in the past with our reciprocant, let me answer that question kind of generically. In the past with our D-series and with our um, Reaxis, we would have LabVIEW drivers that um, can be used for that product. And connect, you'd use LabVIEW and we provide you drivers and connect it in. We have not developed those at this point, so we don't have anything that we can offer you yet, but we are working to that end. So uh, stay tuned, we'll announce out and let everybody know we have it and it will be something you probably would download from our uh, website. So we are working on that. We just released the product and we anticipate that happen very soon. And we have another question that's come in is, do you have heating capability to heat your viscous fluid? Well, with, with this pump, we do not provide that capability. You can use an external heat source from uh, another, uh, sadly to say, another vendor. Uh, we do have stuff like that for our syringe pumps. We have the, the heating jacket and temperature control jackets for our syringe pumps. But for the standpoint of a peristaltic pump, we don't. And literally, you would probably want to, you wouldn't heat it around the pump. You, you probably could put it in a bit of an oven. I'm not sure how well that would work. I'd have to check that. But you want to heat it before it goes into the hose and, and as it flows through. So you would probably have to use an external heating source, maybe a, a hot water bath or something like that. Any other questions out there? Um, another question that's come in is, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Is there a way to calculate shear rate for our pump? Um, well, you know, uh, it is kind of minimal shear uh, issues with this pump. You know what? I will probably have to pull that up and see if there is a way to calculate that out, but I'm not sure uh, it will be very high only because uh, it's kind of designed for the, the peristaltic technology is designed to be uh, almost shearless. So uh, we will have, I'll have to get back to that. If you want to email me directly or email us directly, I can answer that to you uh, right directly. Any other questions out there? All 
Um, we do have one question, uh, one, last, yeah, one other question here. It, the customer wants to know, you know, can you, you know, multiple pumps, can you control multiple pumps uh, with the, the software or the, the drivers that you're developing? Um, you know what, we haven't gotten that far yet. We do know that many people use sometimes three, four, five, six of these pumps at a time. Um, I know there is uh, controller software out there by other vendors that can manage all that together. Um, we haven't developed the drivers yet. We will look to be able to do that. But um, I would say if you're something you're looking for right now, um, definitely look. Uh, there's other some large vendors out there. I think iControl from Miller Toledo or something like that can manage the multiple uh, products like that, uh, multiple peristaltic pumps. Anybody else? Okay. Good. Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Uh, just a reminder, this will be available on Teledyne ISCO's YouTube channel later on this week. And a big thank you to Nick for walking us through information on the Perry Access. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us directly through Zoom and we can pass along and make sure we get you taken care of. Thanks everybody, have a great day, whether it be an afternoon, evening or morning. Thank you very much for joining.